And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. Pastor Mike here, and I'm online, and I'm on live, and this is the talk show that hell hates. The more you listen, the more you know why. I am going to pick back up where we left off on Tuesday, uh, understanding uh, uh, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. She is the goddess of, I guess you could say, the goddess of this world. She is seen in the Bible as Ashtaroth, um, who else? Diana, in the book of Acts, you'll see her there. And by the way, when she is Ashtaroth in the Old Testament, she is accompanied by her boyfriend, Osiris, or as uh, the Old Testament puts it, Baal. Um, and the Jews were constantly going back to worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth. They're still doing it to this day. It's called the Kabbalah. It is a mystery religion, and it has a secret doctrine attached to it, just like the mystery religion of the Vatican, just like the mystery religion of Freemasonry, just like the mystery religion of every mystery religion that's ever a mystery in the mysterious world that we live in today. Um. But they worship this tree of life called the Sephiroth, and it has these two pillars. Jim Staley of the Hebrew Roots Movement so adequately expressed what the Kabbalah really is all about. And though he says on one side, I don't believe in the Kabbalah, he teaches Kabbalah influence. He teaches Kabbalah illustrations. He's got a video where he's got the tree of life, the Sephiroth there with these two pillars. And one represents the male aspect and one represents the female aspect. And that is Yahweh and Shekinah. Shekinah is this goddess female thing. And he describes Jesus or Yeshua He describes Jesus as being the result of God and the Holy Spirit, who he says is a woman, and how they cohabitated together to make Jesus. And I'm just going, are you insane? Uh, I don't think he's insane. I think he's misled and he's misleading others. But anyway... Uh, Mystery Babylon is Shekinah, and if you hear people talking about, oh, we want the Shekinah glory to come down from God, you got to be careful about what you're asking for, because that is not in your Bible anywhere, and it's not in the Hebrew Bible either. There's a male uh, word in Hebrew, Shekhan, or something like that, that's masculine, and that's the word used to describe God's presence. Shekinah is female. It's feminine. That is not God's presence. That is Mystery Babylon the Great. And they worship Baal and Ashtaroth together. She's a fertility goddess. She is the god uh, that represents this earth. You'll see her as Diana in the book of Acts, whom they said the whole world worships Diana. And that is true. Every place you go, in every culture, every civilization, throughout history, they have worshipped a female fertility goddess that represents this earth. And I was, I was just absolutely stunned. I was floored today. Um, I did a, um, a radio interview with uh, um, Sheila Zelensky. And she um, mentioned this, and my jaw just dropped. I've done a little bit of research, and uh, you'll find this article on on facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online. I have a ton of articles that I put up there today, uh, some of which I cannot read over the air. Parents, um, if you're going to go to facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online, uh, just be careful. There's an article there that it, it I don't it, it doesn't have like dirty pictures on it and stuff like that, and I can't even tell you what it is. You'll have to go there and and take a look. But it just it stuns me what's going on in this world. Uh, needless to say, whoredoms and fornication and adultery and all sorts of lasciviousness and uncleanness in this world. She's the mother of. 
She's the goddess of those things. And uh, um, I mentioned to you there was a, a thing that uh, Sheila Zelensky mentioned uh, this morning that r- really got my attention. This whole Bruce Jenner thing. And he he now refers to himself. See, I'm use I'm using I'm using the gender pronouns that the news media does not use because they've been instructed not to refer to him as Bruce. They've been instructed to refer to him as a her, as a she, as Caitlin, but not Bruce. He's not Bruce anymore. He's had a transformation. And I read this read this article and I read what's being talked about about this transformation. Um, and if you don't know what's going on, Bruce Jenner, 1976 gold medal winner in the decathlon, which is DECA is 10. There's 10 events that you have to master uh, in track and field in the Summer Olympics, and he was a gold medal. So, And he's the American male prowess icon. Put on a box of Wheaties, the breakfast of champions. Now he adorns the cover of a box of Fruit Loops. And uh, because he has transformed himself, he has transgendered himself, and now wants to be referred to as Caitlyn Jenner. The Bruce Jenner of the past is dead and gone. And now Bruce has had this transformation taking place. And he is... He is the goddess of transformation. I'm going to read. I'm going to read some things today. It just it stunned me when I heard this, and I, I, I can't. I won't even get into it yet. I want to get to the scripture first. We were talking about Jezebel. If you want to understand Mystery Babylon, study just study women in the Bible. Not every woman is a representation of Mystery Babylon. There are two types of women in the Bible. There is uh, godly women, holy women. Uh, Sarah, the Bible described Sarah as a holy woman because she adorned herself the way she adorned herself. Uh, The fact that she referred to her husband as Lord. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know of any woman anywhere that's ever referred to her husband as Lord. However, there is a beautiful big teaching about this, and we are that woman. We are the bride. We are to adorn ourselves likewise as that bride, and our husband is the Lord, Jesus Christ, Jehovah, God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Somebody say amen. But that's who we are. But there's two types of women in the Bible. There is there is the virtuous woman. And the glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, she is the she is wisdom. She is um, she is represented as like Sarah, Rachel, uh, Hannah, different women in the Bible who were of a godly sort. My curtain just opened. Did you see my curtain? Don't pay any attention to the man behind that curtain back there. I'll have to get up and and change that. Uh, but anyway, she is represented as this wise, virtuous, beautiful. Proverbs 31 is the church. It is. You go read it with that in mind. But the other woman in the Bible is a harlot woman, or she is a she is a witch, or she is rebellious, or it, just different things like that. Think of um, think of um, um, well Jezebel, and I'm going to read some verses here about her. Think of Delilah. Delilah was the seductress who lured Samson in. And Samson, are you are you listening to me, guys? Samson had a problem with the lady folk. God was still using him, but it was his downfall. I'm telling you guys, wake up. You have Delilah, you have Jezebel, you have uh you have other you have uh Herodias, you have um and, and think about this, Herod, the king, was, you could say he was a pedophile, 
because here is uh, Herod's wife's daughter doing this little jiggly dance in front of him, turning him on, and he's he's going, I'll, I'll give anything you want. And she said, thank you very much. Thanks for that. <laughs> I've got good help around here. The union hall has sent me some good help down here. Amen. <laughs> But anyway, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's King Herod, and he's got to do what he said. I want John the Baptist's head on a charger because I'm telling you, you listen to me. Babylon hates the prophet of God. She hates the word of God. She hates anybody and will destroy anybody who carries with them the word of God. That's her. Um, as it relates to Jezebel... She, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, she hate, she wants Elijah killed. So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he's, she's talking about Elijah. In um, 1 Kings 21, we're going to read that here in a little bit. I'm going to skip over that. Um, in 1 Kings 21, 25, the Bible says there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Jezebel stirs up wickedness, and she stirs up wicked people. Jezebel doesn't let anything just lay. Jezebel will not, or Mystery Babylon, will not allow the, just the status quo to remain. She is all about revolution. Stirring things up, and if you you get this idea of like a like a pot of stew, you got a pot of stew on, or a pot of soup on, or a pot of chili on, and you take that spoon and you stir that up to get everything all mixed together real good. It's all in a. That's what she does. She stirs things. I I am not kidding you. I have seen women. I've seen men do it too, but I've seen women work behind the scenes to do nothing but to stir people up, getting this group over here against this group, and now they hate each other because this group found out what this group said about them, and this group found out what this group said about them, and really it was her in the middle stirring up both groups to get them to hate each other. Can you I, Listen, I'm going to tell you what. That's going on right now. That's going on in churches. That's going on in marriages. That happens on Facebook. That's going, on, that's going to happen between nations. But evil just cannot just lay still. It's like, it's like uh, walking up on a cow pile. You know what that is? Cow pile. And a cow pile in a field will get sort of like a crust over it until you stir it up. You stir it up and it's still got that juicy goo in the middle of it, and you're going, <coughs> oh my God. That's what Jezebel does. She likes to stir it up. She incited Ahab to do just about every vile, wicked thing that Ahab ever did. That's her. 2 Kings 9.22. It came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is, this, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? Now, here, stop, if you could stop right there. Jezebel hates peace. She hates it. And she won't, she won't have it. If there's ever peace in a home... Mystery Babylon, Jezebel, will always try to break that up. And I believe our God is a God of peace. Amen? He is the Prince of Peace. If there's peace in a church where everybody's getting along, Jezebel will inject herself in there, stir everything up, and now there's not peace there. I remember, I'll give you a testimony. I remember several years ago, this is at the time, I mentioned to you that God wanted me to read Proverbs about four or five times, and I did. And God enlightened me about this, about these two women. And at the time, we had, um, our ministry was, we had a daycare center. We had a Christian school here. Both of them were really, really suffering, and so we shut them down. That's what 
freed me up to start doing the Watchman broadcast, and here I am. But we had this daycare center, and we'd had some problems with, um, I won't mention anything. We had some problems, a lot of women together, and things happen. And, you know, this group talking to this group, and this woman's not wanting to do what this group is wanting her to do. And it just, it was a mess. And I was wanting peace, is what I was wanting. And I thought for a while I was going to have it, but I could just tell that there was there was something there, something going on, and I had no idea what it was. I had no clue what it was. And I come in here one day, and I am just God. I can't, I can't take that. I don't. I. It wasn't like any event was going on that I was aware of. But there was such a heavy spirit here. And I, God, please, I can't, I can't go on. God, I, I need to know what's going on. Why is this, why is it so heavy here? And it was one of those things where the Holy Ghost is pressing you to open your Bible and read it. So I did. I grabbed my Bible and I opened it up and I opened it up to 2 Kings chapter 9. And when I kind of saw what was there, I went, that's not the right place. And I was about ready to open up someplace else. And the Holy Ghost is going, no, 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 right there. Look, look. So I read, is it peace? And he answered, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And right then, right then, I knew that the spirit of Jezebel was still in that place residing in somebody. And I didn't know who it was. But there were some, there were some little issues that I thought, you know, could be easily taken care of in our daycare center. So I wrote up, I sat down, I wrote up a little memo for all the employees and a list of, here's what I want. Here's what you should do. Uh, and so on. Just some general guidelines that I want, wanted everybody to follow. I went down to where the daycare center was, and I handed out all these, handed out these memos to every employee down there. It took this gal an hour after she read that memo to pack her stuff up, walk out of her classroom, and she was just hitting the high spots on the road as she left. She left that job within an hour of me giving out that memo. It was then that I started hearing what was going on behind the scenes. This Jezebel was, was working behind the scenes trying to get the daycare supervisor's job by trying to destroy both morally and and emotionally, the daycare director we had on staff at that time. And I found it out after she left. And when that, when she left, the spirit left with her. And I learned something that day. I mean, I learned this. Jezebel and her whoredoms and her witchcrafts, this is who she is. Again, if there's adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, uncleanness, Evil concupiscence. Um, what is some of the other words the Bible uses? Effeminacy. If those things are present, she's the one that, by and large, brought them there. She. That's what she represents. She represents whoredoms of all kinds, and she represents witchcraft of every kind. And, and again, you study your Bible. Study your Bible. There are two and only two religions in this world. There is Bible Christianity, which is grace by faith and trust in the Word of God, and witchcraft, which is perform if you want something. And that's the only two. Every other religion in the world that has a works-based blessing of some kind is witchcraft. And Jehu said, there is, as long as there is witchcraft and whoredoms here, there can be no peace. And so he had her killed. 
Uh, and oh, I like this one. I like this because this is just one of those things that if you believe the King James Bible, you get it. Um, let me read one more thing about Jezebel, and then I'll get back to how to how how you get her out. Okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, she shows up again. She shows up again. Now, we don't know in the church of Thyatira if there was actually a woman named Jezebel in that church or Christ was using um, a spiritual name for this for this woman individual in that church. Could be either way. Could be either way. But, and in, you know, you kind of think about it. There is There are no Little baby girls born who the mother's name, oh, she's so cute. I will call her Jezebel. That doesn't exist. But anyway, look at this. Here's the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus said, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest, which means allow, that woman Jezebel. Number one, she is self-appointed. She calleth herself a prophetess. She is self-appointed, self-ordained. She has risen up herself to declare authority in in a place where she has no authority. Zero authority. But she assumes the role of authority. I had a man tell me, he he asked me, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, do you have a house prophet in your church? I said, yeah. I said, his name is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jesus. You want me to go on? He said, no, 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 you got to have a house prophet. you got to have someone in your church that is hearing from God and will declare the word of the Lord to you in that church. And I said, yeah, I, I do. I have, I have uh, Elijah, Enoch, Moses, David, Solomon, um, again, the apostle John. I have Peter and Paul. Do you know who the house prophet in this guy's church was? It was his wife. She was the house prophetess. And on their website, she was named Prophetess Blankety Blank. And shake my head. She, and here's the thing in a church where these house prophetesses are, the bishop does not have final authority. He relegates his authority over to the prophetess who can override him while he's preaching and say, hold it, I'm getting something from the Lord right here. God's saying, no, that, that, that that's not what that means. Here's what God's given me right here. What it really means is this. That's what they'll do. House prophetesses. Jezebel calls herself a prophetess. Do you know what she's doing? She is overriding the authority of scriptures by claiming that she's getting extra biblical revelations from God that override the scripture. That sounds like <clears throat> the Vatican. Sounds like Roman Catholicism. It sounds like Beth Moore. It sounds like Heidi Baker. It sounds like uh, what was it? Benny Hinn's girlfriend. I can't remember her name. Paula Paula White. These people, these women, rise to the le- Joyce Myers rise to the level of having authority over the church, which you ought not have. You can argue that all you want to, and I'm telling you, Paul said that the women were to keep silent in the church. You don't believe that? I can't help you. That's the authority of scriptures that someone has told you doesn't apply to you. She calleth herself a prophet, a prophetess. She teaches and she seduces my servants. Think about it. To commit fornication, there's two types of fornication. There is fornication and adultery that is human-related between a man and a woman, or a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, or whatever, multiple, or spiritual fornication, where a church, rather than being submissive and obedient and pure, in waiting for her husband, Christ, she goes out after other gods and commits whoredoms with them. Any talk, any talk whatsoever from a pastor, blogger, YouTube video, Sunday school literature, whatever, 
that uses the terminology, you must have intimacy with God. That's not God. That's not the God of the Bible. You will not find anywhere in the Scriptures where it refers to your relationship with God as intimacy. It's not there. That is a man-injected concept into the philosophies of churches all over the world now that are regarding this relationship between you and this deity as pretty much sexual in nature. That's teaching the servants to commit fornication and then to eat things sacrificed unto idols. That right there is the epitome of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic system eats things that are sacrificed in front of a crucifix. They are sacrificed to idols, and we, according to Acts 15, my goodness, they met. They met. The apostles, the church elders, met in Acts chapter 15 in Jerusalem, and they were trying to deal with this issue of whether or not the Gentiles should keep the law. And the Jews spoke up and said, yes, they got to keep the law. And several of them said, uh, wait a minute. Let's, uh, let's think about this for a minute here. Let's ask ourselves as Jews the question, have we ever kept the law? And they all went, hur, 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 hur. the answer is no, we have not kept the law, so why should we make the Gentiles do what we've been incapable of doing? So he gave them four instructions. Number one, don't eat, don't eat anything that's been strangled like as been hanging from a tree. Number two, don't eat anything with the blood in it, like transubstantiation, or blood sausage. Number three, do not eat anything that has been sacrificed to idols, as in the, the uh, Eucharist in the Roman Catholic or Lutheran or Episcopal Church, or any denomination or church that teaches trans substantiation. I want you to think about, because we're going to talk about transformation today, because that's who Jezebel really is. That's who Mystery Babylon is. She is a transforming entity, spirit. And so we have transubstantiation, which essentially takes something that is mundane or earthly or vulgar or common and transforms it into a god. See it? That's what they do in the Roman Catholic Church. They take this mundane piece of nothing, and the priest performs a ritual over it, sacrifices it unto a god hanging on this cross thing, and says, now this is God. The whole mystery doctrine of every mystery cult in the world is acted out right there in every Roman Catholic Church. Thousands of times a day, this happens. She teaches her students to commit fornication and things sacrificed in the idols. He said, I gave her space to repent. She wouldn't. He said, therefore, I'm going to cast her into a bed uh, w- with them that commit adultery. I'll kill her children. And I wa- he, said, I'm going to do- he said, I'm going to be mean about it because I want all the churches to know that I mean business. If they call themselves a church and they call me as their Lord, then you better get ready for me to be the Lord because I'm going to deal with some things. Now, here's, here's what I like. Here's how you get rid of her, okay? She's not easily gotten rid of, but it can be done. Uh, let's see here. It's back in 2 Kings chapter 9, I like this. Because the day that God showed me through the Word that there was a Jezebel spirit there, Do you know what drove it out? The written word of authority. I wrote a memo, and it had my signature on it, and it was my authority saying, this is what I want done. And as soon as she got it, down the road she went, never to be seen again. Watch this. In 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jez- Jezebel, 
By the way, she's got Baal's name in her name. That's the Baal part of it. Jezebel. She is named after her god, Baal. When Jezebel heard of it, she painted her face with a brush and a roller, and she put uh, firestone tires on her head. If you're reading it, it's what it says. She tired her head. She put firestone, or maybe they were good rich. She put good rich tires on her head. No, it means she attired her head. She fixed her hair all up. And she looked out a window. And as Jehu entered in the gate, you know why she's doing this? She sees Jehu coming. So she goes and whores herself all up in her appearance. And she leans out that window, right? And she's hoping that when Jehu sees her, he's going to say, Oh, I don't know, man. She's good looking. I don't think I'll kill her now. That's what she was hoping. Jehu entered into the gate and said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master, lifted up his face to the window and said, Who's on my side? Who? I like this. I like this. And there looked out to him two or three. Wow. And you're going... Wow, what? At the mouth of two witnesses or three, let every word be established. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and let one interpret. That's how you get her out. That's how you get her out, okay? Because remember, she hates this book. She can't stand it. It, it kills her. Literally, it kills her. It was the word of the Lord through the prophet um, Elijah that proclaimed the dogs, Jezebel, the dogs are going to eat you and you're going to be dung in the field. And the two or three eunuchs acting as one picked her up slung her out that window, and the dogs came and ate her. And hours later, she was dog's dung in the field. So that people were going, is that Jezebel? That's what happened to her. Now, let's get it. Let's look at, let's, Let's look at uh, 2 Kings 21, or no, 1 Kings 21, because we're going to look at this aspect of, of, of a change or a transformation. Um, let me show you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up on the screen, not very long, uh, but I'm going to show you what I'm referring to. There's a lot of things going on right now in this world, and I, I'm just, again, I'm just amazed at the number of uh, articles, trends, things that are happening around the world that are all leading to a transformation of literally everything in this world. There is a change coming. Bruce Jenner represents an element of that change. Transgendered, transhuman. There's even... Something going on called transabled. That's what this is right here. Transabled. And you say, I've never heard of that. Let me tell you what it is. Transabled is you think that your body parts are not, they don't work very well on your body or they don't fit or you don't like them. So you injure yourself in some way so that your legs or your arms or whatever don't work the way they're don't work have them cut off one guy one guy cut his cut his arm off why so he could have a prosthesis arm now you're saying that is just so bizarre yeah it is but i i want you to think about something we're going on in levels here just like masons do we're going in levels and we are being taken to the next level at just about every trend that comes along. We have been introduced 
to body modification. When I was a boy, the only people in the world that had tattoos were biker gang guys and guys that come back from the military. Those were the only people in the whole world who ever got a tattoo. Mean, hippie, thug kind of guys, rough guys, went and got tattoos. Now, now, we're not, people are not just getting tattoos. They're not just getting mom tattooed on their arm. They are involved in whole body art and body modification. You know what that means? Change it. Change the appearance. Change the ability. People are getting what they call sleeves. First time I ever saw that was my brother-in-law's daughter. She comes in. She got her sleeves on, and what that she has had her arms tattooed, both of them, from the shoulders all the way down. She has tattoos on her neck. The rest of her, I'm not even going to ask. But she has fallen into this idea of body modification. And then it, it, it kind of goes on from that. You see these people with these holes in their ears or in their face or they'll have piercings everywhere. And people are gradually graduating into body modification. The transabled movement is going to grow because as people decide that this hand, I'm, I'm right-handed, this hand doesn't do me a whole lot of good. I'm, I'm right-handed, so my left hand's weak. I can't write with it. I can only hold the plate while I use my fork or whatever, um, but I can't do a whole, so let's, let's take this off and put a prosthetic arm in its place. Now, 20 years ago, that would have left you with a severe disability. I remember, you remember this, seeing people 20, 30 years ago with these little prostheses on, and there's just this little hook thing like this, and that's all they had, and we're just going, Mom said, don't stare, Mike, don't stare, don't stare at them, okay? Transabled people, oh, they want you to stare. They want you to see what they're doing, because now, with the, with the growing um, knowledge that's in technology, the prosthetic replacement parts that are coming in the next year or two or three or five are going to be able to outdo what your original body part could do to begin with. And so it's no surprise to me that a, a movement of transabled people, they're changing their abilities. Five, ten years ago, they would have been reducing their abilities. Five to ten years now in the future, they are only going to enhance their abilities as human beings. Transformation is, we are in the age of transformation. And that is what Jezebel does for a living. This is who she is. I want you to follow me on this. First Kings 21. Let me get a swig here. I speak and talk, and a lot of moisture leaves my body while I'm doing it. You wouldn't want to be standing like right here in front of me, I guarantee you. It's like going to a Gallagher concert or something like that. 1 Kings 21, verse 1. I want you to look at the role that Mystery Babylon Jezebel plays. It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. I want you to think about the vineyard. Vineyard is DNA. And vines even look like DNA. A vineyard is your DNA. The vineyard is the book that God wrote of you and who you are. It's what you own. And by the way, it is your inheritance, isn't it? Because your mother and daddy handed down their sets of DNA to you, and what are you going to do? You're going to hand it down to your children. That's what we do. And it's just like the field, the vineyard that Naboth had. He received it from his father. He was going to pass it down to his son. But obviously, at this point, Naboth doesn't have an heir yet. He doesn't have anybody to hand down the vineyard to. The vineyard is our faith. The vineyard is our, is our country. Our constitution is the vine from which we all gain our liberties and hold our liberties. It's the vine. 
And the vineyard is the Constitution. It is what gives us our freedom in this country to say, hey, Bruce, you're a sodomite. See, I can say that. I can say that in this country right now. It is the truth of the Word of God. God, hey, Bruce, God made a law in his word that said that a man was to not wear the, the attire of a woman. Bruce, what you're doing is you're breaking God's law. See, I can say that, and there's not soldiers rushing in to shoot me in the head. Today, I can say that because I have been given the liberty in this country to preach the word of God without fear of any man. That's going to change. It's not, oh, I hope it, I hope it, I wonder if it's going to change. It is going to, this country is going to be transformed. You watch it. We're going to watch it. We're going to see it happen, I think, in our lifetime. So anyway, he had this vineyard, and uh, it was hard by the palace of Ahab, king of, of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Nabal, saying, give me thy vineyard. Give it to me, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. Listen to this now. Here, watch this. Here's your, here's your body modification and your transhuman and your transgenderism. Listen to it. I will, give, I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Do you see that? My, my hand is part of my vineyard. It is a branch of the vine of Mike Hoggard. The transhuman, human plus, uh, body modification, transabled movement, transgendered movement, says that this body part that you have, I have something better than what you have. See it? Even in the transgendered movement, same principle, same idea. Hand me your vineyard. Give me your vineyard. I will give you a better one than the one you have. And I'm telling you, people all over this world are going to trade in their DNA for new DNA. They're going to do it. Because, because of how everyone is pouring out their affection, their adoration, and listen to this now, their worship of a new goddess that has been born. Let me read this. This is, again, this is on uh, facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online. Uh, this uh, shows up on uh, prisonplanet.com. Many liberals react, to, I, and I'll tell you something. Wh what I'm going to read to you is not what Bruce Jenner and his publicist sent out to all the news outlets for everybody to, to start using. This came out of the zeitgeist, the spirit of today. This came out of normal people who have a different spirit in them than you and I. We look at Bruce Jenner and say, that is an abomination. A man standing there, having himself surgically altered, standing there in a pair of woman's panties. That's an abomination before Almighty God. We look at that and we don't go, oh, he's so brave. We don't do that. Many liberals reacted to the Vanity Fair cover featuring Bruce Jenner's transition into Caitlyn Jenner by proclaiming Jenner, listen to this now, to be a goddess. And ordering everyone to bow down and worship her. That's not an exaggeration either. In, in fact, one uh, trans tweeter was so enraptured by the whole spectacle that he remarked about how Jenner could blankety blank stab me right now and leave me for dead and I'd die blanketing overjoyed. We are not worthy of this goddess. That's somebody that tweeted that. Others hailed Jenner as a literal goddess. While one vowed to pray to goddess Caitlin for the soul of let's see, Drake Bell, an actor who was savage for tweeting that he would still call Jenner Bruce. I am Bruce. Guardian writer Paris Lee has also ordered everyone to bow down, expletive, and genuflect, which is what 
Catholics do when they walk in front of one of their idols. They genuflect. They bow down in the presence of Jenner's angelic image. Did you catch that? An angel in the flesh. As Brandon O'Neill writes, this is a palpable religiosity to the wild hailing of Bruce slash Caitlin as a modern-day saint, a Virgin Mary. Within four hours, more than a million people were following Bruce slash Caitlin's new Twitter account, hanging on her words like the expectant horde waiting for Moses at the foot of Mount Sinai. Can you believe that? Celebs and commentators greeted her as a kind of Messiah. Those who dared blaspheme the new goddess were the victim of swiftly organized witch hunts with Twitter users targeting anyone who still had the temerity to address Jenner by his former name. I made that word his. Uh, let's see here. What else was tweeted? I thought there was a whole bunch of them here. People honoring her as a, as a goddess. Um, let's see here. Just as those who denied the divinity of Christ were once expected to recant their heresy, so those who deny the gender of Caitlyn Jenner are hounded by bots into apologizing for their moral error, writes O'Neill. The American gay rights group GLAAD is scouring the mainstream media for any use of the word he in relation to Caitlin. I wonder if they're going to scour this program. Um, it has issued speech pol policing guidelines for the media. Don't refer to her by her former name. Do avoid using male pronouns and Caitlin's prior name even when referring to events in her past. I'm going to pull up. Uh, let's see here if I can do it easily. On my browser, I, I have. I'm going to have to go to that story because there was a ton. I'm typing in www.facebook.com slash Pastor Mike online. And if you go there, you'll see all of the um, articles and stories. And here, let me pull the one up because there was like, I want to read these tweets to you of what people were calling Kate, Kate Bruce what they were calling Bruce, all right? Uh, by the way, there is an article there that you'll see. Bishop Oliver Clyde Allen and his husband make Ebony Magazine's list of America's 10 coolest families. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. A bishop of a church has a husband. See, that disqualifies him, doesn't it? Because a bishop's supposed to be the husband of one wife, Bible says. Oh, my goodness. Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. Here it is. I want to read these tweets to you. Uh, here's another one. Let's see. Caitlin Goddess Jenner is one. Caitlin Jenner, a.k.a. actual real-life goddess on earth. Here's another one. Caitlin is honestly the queen and goddess of 2015. I don't care what anyone says. Here's another one. I just saw a picture of Caitlin, literal goddess. Here's another one. These pics of Caitlin are making me need a fan. Such a goddess in human form. Here's another one. Caitlin should be praised as a goddess. Another one. But there's no denying that Caitlin is a literal goddess. It Listen, if you believe the Bible, if you believe the Bible, it doesn't take you very long to figure out what spirit this is. This spirit is none other than Mystery Babylon the Great, Jezebel, who wants to give the vineyard away in exchange for a better one. Uh, pastors, God showed me this long time ago. I pastor the church I grew up in. I know some pastors that have a ministry of they go in they, to a church, they kind of get it settled and grounded, and then they move on. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything against that. It's a legitimate ministry, and I know some guys who are really good at doing it. I wouldn't be, but I know some guys who are. But there are also pastors out there who jump into a church, and after about two or three years, when they decided that they can't 
turn that church around in two years' time. They just run out on it. And God, but I, I have a unique thing. I have my home church. Been here since 1974. I was eight years old. And, and I have seen the death. I woke up to this this morning. I've seen the death now of most of the adults that I saw in this church in 1974. I've, they're gone. There's, there's one left. One. Sister Bernice Whitehead, who I love dearly. And you pray for her. You don't know her, but you pray for her. But anyway... This, it dawned on me as God began to deal with me about issues in my life and in the ministry. It dawned on me that I had been given an inheritance. That the men who formed this church had dreams of what it was to be, and they knew that they had a work to do, and they did it, and then they handed it down to me at a time when I wasn't sure that I wanted it. I wasn't sure. I knew for a fact I didn't deserve it. And at a time where I was still had enough of the old Mike in me that I was going to do some things in this church, it wasn't right, like have a rock concert, bring in an NIV, stuff like, and make it user-friendly, seeker-friendly. And God began to deal with me about the vineyard that I had. God used some of these ancient saints at Bethel to remind me, Mike, these people I put in this church to build it, to get it going, and they're giving it to you. You've received an inheritance. Act like it. God began to deal with me about not just selling out my church, because it means everything to me. My marriage is an inheritance. means everything to me. The vineyard of my family. And so here's, ne- here's Ahab offering a better one. B- by the way, can, can I just say this to you? I, I, I'm not, I know that sometimes marriages get in some really big problems. And some people just can't work it out. I'm not, trust me, I'm not trying to beat anybody over the head about how their marriage went bad. But I'm telling you, there is no commandment in the scriptures anywhere that says you have to divorce over this issue or over that issue. Doesn't exist. And I realized that the devil would try to offer me a better vineyard. And then I realized there isn't one. Not with what I've got. There is no better vineyard. Amen? Anyway, that's what Ori said, do it in money. He said, I'll give you the worth of it in money, and that's what a lot of preachers are jumping into. They just want the money. Nabal said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread, honey? Huh? What's the matter with my baby? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. (laughs) And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Oh, poor sugar, dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. You poor thing. You're just so cute. I'll give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Don't you worry, honey. It's going to be yours. Happy birthday, darling. That's Jezebel. 
You know, you know why? You know how I know that? Her her lips and her mouth and her words are smoother than oil. Oh, she's a sweet talker, guys. She wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with the seal. By the way, Jezebel writes letters. Jezebel will have, watch this now, the king, there's, there's, in, the, in the words of a king, there's power, the Bible says, and here you have a King James Bible. That is the powerful word of God. Jezebel will always have a replacement. Always. Jezebel's a writer. Okay? She's going to write stuff and put the king's authority on it and write it under his name, but it's not his book. Jesus is the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And she writes books and letters that have his name on it that he didn't write. That's another aspect of it. She she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. You go on and read this. She, you know who she used as false witnesses? Sons of Belial. That's, you know who that is? Belial's the devil. Bel, Isle. There's, there's that name again, Baal. Sons of Belial. Literally, I believe literally. Just like Paul said, thou child of the devil. Jesus said, you generation of vipers. It's all there. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Right there in Genesis chapter 3. It's there. That's who's on her side. Always. But I I was pondering this one day, and, and, and it's like the Holy Ghost was just saying, Mike, whatever is under authority that I give them, Jezebel, the devil wants that control. He wants that authority. God gave custodianship of the earth to mankind. He has dominion over the fowls of the air, over the cattle, over the creeping things of the earth, over the fishes sea of the sea, and over the sea itself. Man has dominion over that. And the devil wants that dominion. Jezebel is the one who's going to get that dominion area over to Satan. She's that agent of transformation. Think about in this country. We are a constitutional representative republic. They keep trying to tell us that we're a democracy. That's not, no, that's not it. We don't even elect a president in, under the form of a democracy. We use representatives to elect our president. We vote, but every state's vote has a certain number of electoral votes, representatives, live human beings that will take the state's majority vote and cast that number of electoral votes to vote for the president. That's our system. I like that system. It ought to remain that way because this is not about the majority rules. It's about representatives representing the people based upon a written set of laws that are not easy to change called the Constitution of the United States of America. And the devil will be, or Mystery Babylon, Jezebel, will be responsible for transforming our nation from a constitutional representative republic over to some sort of democracy or centralized government. Anyway, but whatever it is, we're going to throw out the Constitution because it doesn't work anymore. That's what she does. Jezebel would be the one who will transfer authority over a family from one man to maybe another man or a woman. Jezebel will do that. Jezebel will be the one. This pastor down in South Carolina... Do you know who killed him? Jezebel. That's who killed him. Every man, doesn't matter if he's a preacher or not, but especially in including preachers, and I know because I'm one of them, every man has his Delilah. 
Every pastor has his thorn. Every one of them. And the devil knows how to use that to have great advantage over the man of God. Every one of them do. People don't be fooled. I Listen, I, there's some good pastors out there, and I love them. They're honest. But there's some guys out there that would make you think that they're the hot dog in the whole in the basket and they are better than everybody else and the things that they're trying to teach you are just if you just come up to their level you'd you'd get it listen they got a delilah they've got a thorn they've got a weakness and that pastor down in South Carolina that got killed by those cops he had a weakness And Jezebel caught him in his weakness. And now he's gone. So I want you to look at the big picture. And again, you pray for that. You pray for that church. You pray for that family. You pray for that whole mess. You pray. mm, 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 mm. There's just a lot of things to pray about. I I don't want to say anything. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Everybody's got opinions on it. But now I want you to look at the big picture now. Here's a church that had a pastor that went to the, to the convention of the denomination, Free Will Baptist, and there's some good, good Free Will Baptist preachers that still hold to the old book, and he was one of them. And he went down there, and they said, they were saying, this is what I heard from, from the people that called me, he was, that they were wanting to go a different way other than the King James. They had this issue down in Arkansas, and several pastor friends of mine, they called me, and they said, Pastor Mike, in our, in our district, they're, they're talking about changing the Bible for, like, the preaching meetings and for, like, the, uh, the Bible competitions among the youth. They're talking about changing over to the English Standard Version, and we don't want that. And they said, will you help us? I said, I'll do what I can. And the thing that I did down in Harrison, Arkansas, a couple months ago about um, uh, the DNA and the body of Christ, a lot of that was addressed to those men who were on the side of the King James because they fought the fight. And they, you know what they told me? They said, Mike, pastors that we were friends with that we thought was going to stand with us on that turned coat on us, and they betrayed us. And that happens. This pastor down in South Carolina went to the convention to stand up for the King James Version Bible in that denominational area down there. And Jezebel cut him down. I'm telling you, that's what I think is going on. So now here's a church, and you pray for that church because I want to tell you how it works. It always works when the pastor goes away. Either the pastor is either he's too old and he has to retire, he just can't he just can't cut it anymore, or he's he's been under such heavy pressure that he just can't he there's trouble in the he just can't do it anymore, so he leaves he he resigns, or he gets caught in some he gets caught in affairs, or he gets caught there's I know a pastor that's stealing money from the church. He gets caught in something like that and has to resign. But the big picture is now here's a, here's a sheepfold with no shepherd. And the devil has a long list of qualified men that he would approve being pastor of that church. Those are men that he knows that once they get in there, they're going to change that church over. That church is not going to be a King James. I'm just giving hypothetical here. That, that church is not going to be a King James Bible church for very long because they got him a new pastor in. He is a transitional agent. His mind and his goal is to change that church over from being a King James-only church to accepting these new translations in, the letters of Jezebel. And you pray for this church, because now the light of Israel, that pastor, is gone out of that church. And who knows? Here's, Here's a wounded church. Remember what the strange woman is able to do. Many strong men have been wounded by her. Yes, she has slain many men. She's slain people. She's a killer. And here is a wounded church, 
and all they all they have to have is some agent go into that church as pastor that'll play on their emotions and then transform that church. It happens all the time. Those of you listening to me, you saw that transformation right in front of your very eyes. The old pastor went out, and when the new pastor came in, here goes the King James Bible, here goes the hymn books, here comes the $7.8 million building program that we have to get involved in, here comes the, here comes the new music, here comes the new sermons, here comes the, the pastor now selecting new leaders of the church and take them down to a purpose-driven church conference so they can transform that church and make it grow. That's Jezebel. She is, she is the agent of that transfer or that transformation. That's what she does, and she's very, very good at it. And you pray for that church. The, the other pastor that I talked about on Tuesday, um, after I w- was done with the, uh, with the show, um, a video surfaced of... It was dash cam video, dashboard video from the police car of what appeared to be an unprovoked attack, not the police to him, but him to the police. He he bum-rushed a cop. I have no idea why. They arrested his brother for being drunk. Was he drunk? I don't know. But every pastor has a weakness. We all do. Who knows who's next? But we are living, we are living in the age of transformation. Neurosciencenews.com. Brain's reaction to certain words could replace passwords. You might not need to remember those complicated email and bank account passwords for much longer. According to a new study, the way your brain responds to certain words could be used to replace passwords. In Brain Print, a newly published study in academic journal Neurocomputing, researchers from Binghamton University observed the brain signals of 45 volunteers as they read a list of 75 acronyms such as FBI and DVD. They recorded the brain's reaction to each group of letters focusing on the part of the brain associated with reading and recognizing words and found that the participants' brains reacted differently to each acronym, enough that a computer system was able to identify each volunteer with 94% accuracy. The results suggest that brain waves could be used by security systems to verify a person's identity. This is not science fiction, folks. This is, this is real. This is right here, right now. Uh, Let's see, what else can I read here? Ray Kurzweil. Humans will be hybrids in 15 years. 15 years. Here's the latest from Ray Kurzweil. He's the director of engineering at Google, who spoke Wednesday at the Exponential Finance Conference in New York. Kurzweil predicts that humans will become hybrids in the 2030s. That means our brains will be able to connect, listen to this now, directly to the cloud. Where everything, This program is being recorded right now by me in a cloud account. We use it. We use it all the time. A lot of you don't even realize you're using it, and you're using it. He said they're, they're going to be able to direct connect directly to the cloud where there will be thousands of computers and those computers will augment our existing intelligence. He said the brain will connect via nanobots. Listen to this. Listen listen to this. Tiny robots made from DNA strands. And if they're made, if they're robots with artificial intelligence systems in them and they're made of DNA, DNA is... It's not hard if you already have a strand of RNA to graft it into another strand of RNA as long as the base pairs match up. It's not hard. Or you rewrite the base pairs. By the way, I had a thought the other day. You chase this down in the scriptures, the idea of being grafted in. Like in Romans 11, uh, Paul said we're to receive the engrafted word with meekness. Think about it. It's like... 
two strands of DNA coming together. The Old Testament being joined with the New Testament by four base pairs. I, I, I think I'm just thinking out loud there, but I'm going, I think that's what that means. I do. And you kind of think about it too, all right? Uh, but anyway, he said, our thinking then, listen, listen to what he said, our thinking. Our thinking. This, this is what operates us, is what we think. What the, the processes that goes on inside the human brain is what makes us do what we do, say, see, think, feel, everything. Our thinking, Ray Kurzweil said, will be a hybrid of biological and non-biological thinking. Hybrids. With the mind of a god. That's, that's going to be human. Not me. But that's going to be human. Think about it. We're, we're, we're taking the steps toward that right now. That's what we're doing. Oh, I just got a text message from my wife. I love her. Anyway, uh, we, are, we are working on being hybrids right now. Let's see here. I'll pull up. Oh, let's see here. Google Maps. On my cellular telephone. And right here is our top secret broadcasting compound. Sorry, that's all you get. I turn the camera, there it is. And we're using cloud technology because this map with the satellite data in it is not, the whole map of the entire world is not saved in my phone. Literally, as we're driving around Tampa, uh, when I had my surgery, we had the phone out, and as we're moving down the road, the GPS of my phone is keeping track of where we are, reporting that to Google servers. Google servers is then sending us not only map locations, but also satellite data so I can see what it looks like from overhead and also places of interest, like where to eat and this and that and the other. And we're already developing ourselves into a species that relies upon the digital world to do things that years ago could not even be conceived of. We're doing things right now that in the 1980s, no, no one was thinking that we would be driving vehicles with cell phones that was receiving satellite imagery data so we could see our exact location updated literally every second. We didn't, I had a Commodore VIC-20 for computer for crying out loud, 1982. I never saw myself with the Commodore VIC-20 in a television set inside the car hooked up to a, I don't know, 30-mile-long telephone cord driving around getting satellite data down to my VIC-20 with 8-bit graphics ability. Never thought about it. This is what we're doing now. We're well on the way to transformation right now. We don't even realize it. And, and I'm just, I'm some point, some of you bail out whenever you want to. This car is fixing to roll down the hill. Bail out whenever you think you can. But at some point, all of us are going to have to bail on this. You know what I'm saying? We're going to have to just, we're not, we don't want it anymore. We do, Listen, this, this is as far as it goes with me, buster. But we are turning ourselves into, into little agents of transformation. Um, think this. Think Baphomet. Baphomet is the agent of transformation. Baphomet is neither God nor human. Baphomet is neither beast nor man. Baphomet is neither male nor female. Baphomet is yes and no, zero and one, yin and yang, male and female, man and beast, human and God, all together in one grotesque creature. That's who Baphomet is. Baphomet is the, is the God, you could say, if, if 
Jezebel, Mystery Babylon, is the goddess of transformation. Baphomet is the god of transformation. Um, I've read this article to you before. Elon Musk, Elon Musk, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Elon. It's as far as I can get with it. Has met a technology he doesn't like. Now, Musk owns Tesla, uh, the Tesla Corporation. Tesla is on the verge of putting out a battery. I, I, this is just rumor. I don't know how true it is. But a battery where you pretty much wouldn't need big oil companies and big electric companies. Boy, you talk about transformation, bud. But anyway, here's what Musk said. He said, uh, he told an audience at MIT, which is Mike's Institute of Technology, told an audience at MIT on Friday that, quote, we should be very, very careful about artificial intelligence, warning it may be our biggest existential threat. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon, he said. And all those stories where there's a guy with the pentagram and the holy water, it's like, yeah, he's sure he can control the demon, he continued to some laughs from the audience. Musk then cracked a smile, didn't walk out. <laughs> His Tesla electric vehicles and SpaceX rockets, which recently won a multi-billion dollar contract with NASA, have pushed the limits of their respective Technologies. Musk hasn't embraced artificial intelligence, a field of study at MIT and other schools with significant ethical considerations and business potential. He has previously cautioned it's, quote, potentially more dangerous than nukes. Why? Nukes, nuclear bombs are controlled. Not by the most moral people, grant you, but they are controlled nonetheless. Think like this. Let's say a guy has an artificial intelligence system connected with him. And he uses this artificial intelligence system to hack Wall Street. And within just a few hours of monitoring how Wall Street works, this guy with his enhanced ability of the processing power of an artificially intelligent machine can figure out how to rake in millions of dollars every day by buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and trading all day long to where he comes out on top every time because he's found the secret. He's found the alg algorithm or whatever it is. His intuition along with the computer's guts, make it possible for him to figure out how he can have millions of dollars every day. All right? That's one man. And if a guy makes millions of dollars in sales and trades on Wall Street, then somebody's going to come out on the losing end. So think about it. One guy hybridized himself, and he's hacked Wall Street. Let's say now that a 1,000 guys are able to do the exact same thing. They use the same methods, and they're all trying to control Wall Street. And now instead of the hybrid guys or the hybrid guy fighting against all of the Wall Street bankers and the investment companies, the mere puny humans. Now, the God is fighting all the other gods. And you're going to have a war of gods, a war of people who have gained the the ability of godlike creatures 
but without having the brain or the, the mind of God. In other words, they still have the heart of man, which, number one, loves money, which is the root of all evil, and number two, is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. So if you just have one guy like that, I mean, that's one thing. But if you had a, a thousand human beings who had godlike abilities, there's going to be a war of the gods. So imagine now the entire planet's population, minus all the Bible-believing Christians, who've become gods. They're all going to fight each other. Why? Because that's what we do now. We just have limited ability to do it. But we're gaining in our ability every day. Billions and billions and billions of dollars are spent on trying to get the upper hand in a warfare using technology. I don't want to be any, I don't want any part of that world. I want nothing to do with it. And we're and we're going there. I want you to look at the transformation process from the scriptures. Romans chapter 1, verse 23. Mankind changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. What does what does what does that look like to you? It's changing the glory into the image of un, of corruptible man and to birds, see the wings, and to four footed beast, see the one, two, three, four, and creeping things uh, right here is creeping things right there. I mean, you have it right there. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Bruce Jenner, who and uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of others who changed the truth of God. See the word change? That means, and you know what the truth of God is? It's the King James Bible. That's what the truth of God is. It is the incorruptible word. It, the incorruptible word is written by an uncorruptible God. The God who never changes, the God who never decays, the God who never degrades, who is the same yesterday, today, forever. God didn't change himself. Man changed him. And then he, he changed God into an image like this. And then he changed the truth of God, which is his word, the Bible, into a lie. That's done every church service by pastors who say, now the King James translates it this way, but the, in the original Greek or the original Hebrew, a better translation is this. They just changed the truth of God into a lie. It's like, I don't know, Jimmy and Donnie Swaggart and all their group sends out that Swaggart expository Bible, King James Bible, and literally in just about every verse or at least on every page of the Swaggart Bible is not, not down on the bottom, not over to the side, but embedded into the text of the Holy Scriptures is their opinion of what the original Greek really said that's better than what you just read in the King James text. They're changing the truth of God into a lie. It makes me mad. It makes me angry because I, man, I, I'm, I'm, who am I mad at? Me. Because I used to do it. Shame on me and shame on everybody else for doing that. They're changing the truth of God into a lie. God writes books. You don't change the Bible. God writes DNA. You don't change DNA either. You don't alter it. Uh, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clear something up. Um, people ask me this question a lot. They're, they're concerned that eating genetically modified food is going to change their DNA, or they're concerned 
that um, receiving certain shots. I know some. I know some people who've had bad, bad things happen as a result of vaccinations. So I'm not speaking for them. I'm not necessarily speaking against them. But they're afraid that eating genetically modified food is going to change their DNA. And let me just say this, okay? Um, or, or I've heard them say, "Well, I can't. That's got DNA in, and I can't have that. My body can. I, is that going to? Is that going to harm? Is God forbid that?" And let me just say this to you: Chicken has DNA in it. Even unmodified chicken has DNA in it. If you eat beef and you raise your own beef and you don't alter, that's that's DNA. They have DNA in it. Bread has DNA in it. Carrots have carrot DNA in it. Everything that you eat, minus minerals and salt and pepper and things like, well, pepper's natural. That's that's grown. So it has even pepper has DNA. Salt doesn't have DNA. Um, things fortified with vitamins and iron, that those things don't have DNA. But every, every food thing that we eat, eggs, bacon, cheese, milk, meat, vegetables, wheat, grains, they all have DNA in them. So we eat literally the Word. We eat the Word. We do in our bodies what our soul does. It eats the Word, okay? Just so that'll help you. So... There, I do not think, I do not think, and have not seen any evidence that eating a genetically modified organism causes causes a DNA change that is unalterable inside of your body. Now I say it that way because I think it's clear that there are some things that go bad in this world that some of our cells are damaged and the DNA is not transcribed right, and then you have this bad cell. Um, in, a, in a limited way, your body has the ability to take that thing and destroy it so it doesn't have any effect on the rest of the body. So what I'm saying is, can you eat something that might change a cell or two in your body and it that turns out bad? Yes, and that just that covers the whole expanse of everything that we can eat in this world. But is there anything out there that they're giving to people now, whether it's in food form or shot form or pill form or radio waves from UFOs forms or whatever, harp form or whatever, that is right now augmenting, augmenting and changing man's DNA in an unalterable or irreversible way? And the answer is, I think, no. I don't think it's happening yet. I, and I don't live, I don't live in fear of everything that I put in my mouth that I'm violating God somehow, or I'm going to, I'm going to be in danger of harming my body because it's going to alter my DNA and I'm going to have a pig nose. I'm not, I'm not in fear of that. I don't think you should be either. The Bible says, eat what's set before you. The Bible says that we, God didn't change the law, the dietary laws of the Old Testament. God did not change that. God cleaned the unclean things. When we receive food with thanksgiving and the Word of God, it is sanctified. And we are, I just don't live in fear of things that I eat unless. I'm going, did that have sugar in it? Did that have a lot of sugar in it? Because I feel really sleepy, and I think that had sugar in it. That's that's about the only thing I worry about. I'm going to get a lot of emails on that. But anyway, um, but I am not going to go stand in line to have my DNA changed. Not. I'm not going to go for them altering my genetic makeup just to enhance me or make me better or make me a god. I'm going to leave my DNA intact and let that be the seed, which is the word of God, the incorruptible seed that gives me the new body that I'm going to get one of these days and I'll wait for it. 
Um, along with, along with Paul talking about in Romans about changing the uncorruptible God into an image. He then says in verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. You want to know what vile affections looks like? Let's see if I can pull a picture up of it here. Here is what vile affections look like. God gave Bruce Jenner up. He gave him up to a vile affection. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, Bruce Jenner, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. It means it's not natural. And it's not easy. Working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense, which means payback, of their error, which was meat. In other words, the, um, the punishment befits the crime is what that means. This Bible, I'm telling you, it's right in what it says. It is our guide of what's going on these days. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Look at here, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. I'm going to say this to all my brethren in Kenya. Go to the Bible and find out from the Scriptures what constitutes an apostle. And I say this because there are many, I think they're good men, who have taken on the self-imposed name or office of apostle. Whereas you may be a bishop or an overseer of your church, or you may be an overseer of other churches. That does not make you an apostle. An apostle is someone whose name is Paul or John or Peter or Matthew. That's who an apostle is. Yes, God did give the office of apostle. He gave it to John. He gave it to Matthew. He gave it to Peter. He gave it to James. He gave it to Paul. But it all stops right there. Because the apostles were a, a very elite group of men, a very special group of men. The Greek part of that word, apo, means they were brought out. They were called out. They're separated men. Who have, a, who have a special office. These men are now dead, and yet their office still exists through the word that they wrote. You see, apostles write Bibles. That's what apostles do. They write Bibles. They write the word of God. And to me, it's a violation of the very last of the word of God written by Apostle John, who basically said, we're not going to add any more words after this. This is John was the last apostle, and he died. And when he died, he wrote. The last thing that he wrote is, no more words here. We're done. And I just, I just want to say that to those listening on Watchman FM, KBTR, or anybody in Kenya that I speak to, because it's sort of a there's there's a lot of guys out there that I just, I, I, I love you. I thank God for him calling you into the ministry because your nation, your country needs it. But I want you to rethink and pray about you calling yourself an apostle. Okay? Now, I see in America, men and women referring to themselves as apostle. They know better. They know the Bible. They just don't believe it. 
and they have they have done exactly what this says. They have transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ. They are false apostles. They are deceitful workers, which means that they will make you think that they have words from God that are not in your Bible, and they're going to use those words to deceive you. And Mystery Babylon is the spirit behind that transformation. They transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, let me give you a little King James Bible lesson. Um, in Isaiah 14, and you can use this. Now, write this down. You can use this. This, 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 this part of the broadcast I'm giving to you free as charge. Okay? Isaiah chapter 14. Um, and maybe some of you are going, oh, no. You mean Pastor Mike Online is like I have to pay for it? What am I going to get billed? Because I'm I watch the whole thing. Am I going? No, you don't have to worry about it. Um, Isaiah 14 is much disputed by people who think they're smarter than God, because it says, "How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer?" And everybody and their dog is saying, "Now that is a poor translation. Lucifer is not really the devil. That's not really that's not really his name. It's not Lucifer." It's the morning star. That's who that really is. It's the morning star or the day star or whatever. No, 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 no. His name's Lucifer. King James translators knew that because the Hebrew word Helel, all it means is bright. That's all it means. But they knew based upon 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, that Satan is transformed into, you know what the word Lucifer means? Lucis means light. And Ophir is a Latin ending that means bringer or carrier of or messenger of. So the word Lucifer literally means angel of light or messenger of light. That's what it means. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Think of what Joe Smith saw. He saw an angel of light. It, therefore, it is no great thing if his minister, and the Mormon church is run by apostles. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And what we're seeing here in the Bible is seeing the Bible teach us about transformation. 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's why we spend time looking in the Bible, finding out who Jezebel is, who Babylon is, how Satan works, what spirits are at work here. How can we identify these spirits? How, can we, how in the world can we wrap our head around Bruce Jenner, one of the macho men of the 70s, Turn himself into a woman. How can we wrap our heads around that? We understand that there are agents of transformation working around us nonstop. They're working on transforming the church. They're working on transforming religion in general. They're, and by the way, I don't. I've, some people ask me about Walid Shobat. He's a former. He he calls himself a former terrorist. I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. Maybe he is. But he has this idea that every prophecy in the Bible basically fits Islam. I know there's elements of Islam that I recognize from the Bible, but I'm telling you, it's, it's Islam is a mystery witchcraft religion just like Wicca is and just like Roman Catholicism is and just like everything else is. Islam draws a circle and worships in it. They do that at Mecca. They swirl around Mecca, and they worship an idol. It's called the Black Stone. And Islam has a form of mysticism in it. That's Sunni Islam. And they're no different than any religion in the world, any mystery religion in the world. And I absolutely believe that there is not going to be one 
current religion that's going to outdo all the others in the world, I absolutely believe that religion itself is going to be transformed. Everything is on the table to be changed. All of politics is going to be transformed. Business, government, religion, education, um, the economy, it's going to be changed. It's going to be different. It's going to be transformed. And the devil knows how to do that. Ephesians chapter 5, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You know, the, the shame of it is, is that I have to even deal with this. That's the shame of it. It's a shame to speak of these things. Even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Ephesians 5, 14, Wherefore he saith, Arise thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk. There it is right there. I talk about this verse all the time. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. Now that applies both to life. That means... Be aware of your surroundings. Know what's going on around you. Don't be drunk. Don't be asleep. Walk circumspectly. Circum is a circle. Spectrum is what we do with our eyes. We are spectators. By the way, study the Bible that way. Study the Word. You find a verse in the Bible, draw a big circle around it, and just study what comes before and after that. Look at, look at where it is, and look at it in the context of where it is, not, not just in that one chapter, but in the whole of the Scriptures. And don't be fools who take a little verse out, or a piece of a verse out of context, change the meaning of it, and make you believe their doctrine. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil." Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Then, 2 Corinthians eleven three. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted. See that? The corruption of man's mind. See, Ray Kurzweil says we're going to hybridize ourselves, and our brains are going to be linked in with what's in the cloud, in the computer world. And they all say, that's a, that's a happy day. That's going to be a wonderful day when we can do that. And Paul says, no, that's going to corrupt your minds because it's going to remove you from the simplicity that is in Christ. And I want you to picture what's going on in the light of like this here. And this is just, this is just one of many uh, ritualistic things that a person can do to achieve the top billing. In masonry, you go through the Blue Lodge, the first three levels. From that point, you can be a York Wright Mason, which has 10 more levels. Think about it. There's 13 Or you can be a Scottish Rite Mason, which has 30 more levels, which is 33. And the Mason of low degree attains a high degree, but he can't just go from here to there, all in one shot. Now, Bible-believing Christians, that's what we do. We're going to go from here to there in one shot. Doesn't matter if it's a newborn babe in Christ or someone that's been standing for the gospel for 70 years. We go from this world to the next one step not in grades or degrees or graduations or levels. I'm not any better than anybody else is. 
I may read the Bible longer on certain days than maybe some others, but that doesn't make me more saved or more sanctified or a more of a Christian than someone who doesn't. Or you could flip that around. There may be guys who, I've been in the ministry now. How long have you been in the ministry, Pastor Hoggard? Oh, I've been in the ministry, I don't know, about 20-some-odd years. Really? I've been in the ministry 33 years or 34 years. How big is your church, Pastor Hoggard? Oh, we had about 80 on Sunday. Yes, yes, I have 500, and we're growing every day. That guy's not better than me. Not in the least bit. Doesn't matter. When, when in the parable of the seed and the sower, when the tree produced fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Who cares how much it has? It produced fruit. It did exactly what it was supposed to do, produce fruit. That's all God cares about. But in this world, let's say that up here at the top, at the pinnacle of the pyramid here, is the human who has been transformed into a hybrid God. That's up here. Right now, he's down here. we got to get him up here. So we have to take mankind on these steps, and every step he takes, another ritual is performed, and every step he takes, another piece of knowledge is given to him, secret knowledge. And he takes this step here, and he learns another new thing. And he takes another step, and he learns another new thing up there. And that's what's going on right now. Right now, that's what's going on. You see, we don't go from the 50s when a computer was as big as a warehouse to putting computers in people, turning them into hybrid gods. We don't do that. Can't. Won't work. We have to get each successive generation used to getting the computers just a little bit closer to man. And I'm, I'm as much a product of that as anybody because when I was, when I was in junior high and high school, the computer revolution was just starting. And I, I had some books on computers and, and how they came about and what they were able to do, and I was fascinated by these things. And I wanted one. And, I, and my mom and dad, they, boy, they bought me a Commodore VIC-20 computer, and I thought, oh, this is a whole new world right here. And I, I have on my phone, let's see if I can find it here. I have on my phone a Commodore 64 computer. I can't find it. Anyway, it's on, you trust me, it's on here. My phone will emulate a Commodore 64 computer. Commodore 64 computer had 64 kilobytes of memory. It was an 8-bit computer. And my phone can replicate that operating system with the greatest of all ease. But I don't sit around and write programs for my Commodore 64 and play the games I used to play anymore. I don't do that. Don't use it as a work tool anymore. Because I've gotten to a higher level with computers and cloud computing and operating systems. and so You see what I'm saying here? This is the process of transformation. It all goes in stages and levels, and we are in that process. We're, we're somewhere. We're not down here anymore. No way. We're somewhere here, I think. And every step we take, we get a little bit more knowledge. We get a little bit closer to the end game. and We take another step, and the thing is, when, when Ray Kurzweil said that in the next 15 years we would be hybrids, here's what, something I want you to, I'm not, I wouldn't use, I would not use that at all. 
as a way of saying, I think Hoggard said that in 15 years a rapture was going to happen, and it's not going to happen now. It's going to happen 15 years. Now. I wouldn't say that. Because something that we know about transformation is that sometimes we take a quantum leap up way higher than we would have normally when certain things happen. Think of 9-11. It paradigm shifted everybody in the whole world just about, right? Think about moon landing. Think about JFK being killed. These are all significant things that change our minds and transform us to, a, to being a different person than we were the day before. That's the effect that it has. And Kurzweil's plan of us being hybrids by 2030 in 15 years might just be accelerated drastically by some event or some intervention by spiritual forces. And I'm just, I'm just playing around here with ideas and thoughts. What I'm saying is anything could happen. But the premise is, is that we right now are being taken on the levels to a higher state, a higher state, a higher state, up until where we are gods. Now, again, all of us Bible-believing Christians, at some point, we're going to have to say, I'm jumping off the train right here. This is as far as I go. Amen? Right here and no further. We're not going to go any further than this right here. And I think the jumping off place would be when they want to start putting the technology inside of our body. I think that would be I think that would be the, the where we which, where we should stop right there. I hope I'm making sense to you, all right? Let me uh, let me show you something that I found out about Baphomet. And this is going to be something that is going to show up in a Watchman broadcast not too far from today. Cuz I'm going to be dealing with um Revelation chapter 13, verse 14, about how the false prophet brings fire down from heaven. And I think, I think, I think I know what that is from the scriptures. But here's what Baphomet represents. Baphomet signifies Baphomateos, or baptism of metis, or baptism of fire or the Gnostic baptism and enlightening of the mind. This is from the Encyclopedia Americana from Google Books. That's what, I, that's what I'm pretty sure the word Baphomet means. It's, Baphomet literally is a baptism of fire. And if you think about that concept of fire, what does fire do? When we put raw bacon on the skillet, what does it do? It transforms it so that it is a, a different type of thing than what it was before it went into the frying pan. Fire has that ability. It has the ability to transform. And so we are living in a world right now where these agents of transformation like, like Jezebel, like the harlot woman, like Mystery Babylon the Great, the 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 spirit of this world, as it were, Mother Earth, Mother Nature. Mother Nature hates the fact that God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea, which is why you can go to Long John Silver's or Captain D's or go to McDonald's and eat a fish sandwich because God gave you dominion over the fish of the sea. That's why we can go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and eat fried chicken because God gave us dominion over the fowl of the air. And God gave us dominion over all of the creatures and over the earth. He gave us that dominion. And so the agents of transformation, just like Jezebel, wants to transfer man's dominion over the beasts that are in the sea. Think of the beast in Revelation 13. So that we don't have the dominion. They have dominion over us. There has to be a transformation. There has to be a fundamental change. And I think 
that that transformation takes place as a result of fire. Something about fire changing and transformation. Think of the think of the symbolism of the phoenix. The phoenix goes into the flames of fire and out of its ashes rises up a new phoenix, a rebirth, a a baptism of fire as it were, just like baptism in water for for Bible believing Christians. But yet the water baptism that we do in the baptistry or down at the river, that doesn't change anybody, does it? That already that only just signifies the change that has taken place already by the Holy Ghost and Jesus washing and cleansing the church with the water by his word. That's the real baptism. But a transformation taking place and fire being that transformative agent and baphomet And Mystery Babylon, I think, represent that. So instead of living in a world where man has dominion over the earth, just like what's, uh, let's see if I can find this here, just like what's on the Georgia Guidestones, population reduction, earth and balance, the Copenhagen Summit. This is where all the tobacco chewers got together and talked about how Copenhagen was better than Skoll. That was the Copenhagen Summit. Rewilding, Sustainable Development, Agenda 21. All of these are programs that are going in levels and grades. The United Nations knows that it cannot just come out and say, we're taking over the entire earth. Everybody, get off their land. You're going to have a war. You're going to have a bloodbath on you. So what are they doing? little piece at a time. Obama signed some some sort of executive order or a treaty with the United Nations, and now all of a sudden the the kiddie pool in your backyard is a United Nations bioreserve, and you can't let the water out because some frog decided to reproduce in your kiddie pool, and there's little baby froglets swimming around in there, and you don't have custody over what's in your own backyard. It's just little pieces at a time, people. That's what's going on. Notice that Baphomet is, let me get my ugly picture out of the way. I made this graphic up. I taught this down in Arkansas several years ago. I made this graphic up because it just kind of looked bad in, in a church service to have Baphomet sitting there with her, you know, the things sticking out. So I gave it a Nancy Pelosi t-shirt because I think the Antichrist is a liberal, Okay. Anyway, I want you to notice that he's part man and part beast. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, what would it take? What would it take to get a normal human being to get them to receive animal DNA into their bodies that would alter their entire genetic structure? What would it take to do that? See, a normal, healthy human being would not really be interested. A normal, healthy human being, if you don't have a headache, you don't take Tylenol or aspirin or ibuprofen. If you don't have diabetes, then you don't take metformin. If you don't have high blood pressure, then you don't take, I don't remember, high blood pressure medicine. But you get my point. If you're healthy, you don't do anything, you know, for your body. You just, okay, it's pretty cool. Okay, I, do you need some medicine? No, I don't need medicine. Look at this, man. Here's my medicine right here, Jack. Okay, that's and that's how people are. What is it going to take to get people to accept some sort of beast DNA into their bodies? Some sort of fire transformation mechanism. Some sort of, maybe some sort of disease or virus that's killing millions of people. And the only people who are going to survive are the people who have become the hybrids. The people who are these people here, part of the fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they who I believe are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places for the fourth kingdom right here, shall mingle themselves with 
the seed of men. Remember, Baphomet is, look at his, he's got human and beast parts all together in the same body. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Uh, this graphic didn't turn out right, but this is Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar represents, I think, humanity that had a transformation. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And I absolutely think that that is coming. And I think that a transformation is coming. And Bruce Jenner is like the cheerleader guy of it. Okay? There's our music. Did I already pass the music up? I think I did. That's the replay. Oh, well. I've been talking too much. We'll try to pick this up next week. Let me uh, switch graphics here. I thought there was some kind of strength.